Good evening and welcome to RFL. I'm Andrew Whitman in for Richard French. Ever since Roe versus Wade in 1973, when the Supreme Court established a constitutional right to an abortion, it has been the hottest of hot button issues. It still is, and it remains a litmus test for people on both sides of the aisle. This morning, the Roberts Supreme Court agreed to hear a major new abortion case out of Mississippi, one that is considered a direct challenge to Roe. The case, Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health, concerns a law enacted by Republicans in that state that bans the procedure after 15 weeks of pregnancy and does so with few exceptions. Several red states have been trying to dramatically restrict abortions, in many cases doing so successfully. And their goal is to get their cases to the top court in the land, hoping to get rid of Roe once and for all. Mississippi, no exception. Back in 2018, a federal judge blocked the 15-week law and issued this statement, quote, The state chose to pass a law it knew was unconstitutional to endorse a decades-long campaign fueled by national interest groups to ask the Supreme Court to overturn Roe v. Wade. And now Republicans in Mississippi are getting their wish. The Supreme Court will hear the case in the fall with a ruling expected next year. And with conservatives now holding a 6-3 to three majority, this after Trump nominee Amy Coney Barrett was confirmed late last year, women's rights advocates have serious cause for concern. Our first guest tonight is one of them. Nicole Brenner-Schmitz is a former national political director for NARAL Pro-Choice America. Nicole, this Mississippi case that the Supreme Court has agreed to take up, is this the big one so many have been fearing for so long? Is this a case that could end Roe versus Wade or just do more damage to it? No, this, this is serious. This could end Roe v. Wade. This goes right at the heart and core of what Roe is and the protections that it provides, and it, it strikes it down. Uh, there's probably as many as 24 states that would attempt to ban abortion outright. There's already 11 states that have trigger laws, which means if, if this was to go through SCOTUS, these would, these, would, these would automatically trigger, take place in those states. So this is, this is the most serious threat we've seen come to Roe in a long time. Just last June, the court ruled 5-4 against a Louisiana law that restricted abortion access. Of course, since then, the court lost Ruth Bader Ginsburg and added Amy Coney Barrett. That followed another ruling that protected abortion rights in 2016. The timing of these cases isn't a coincidence. The anti-abortion movement has been queuing these cases and these laws up to test the court every time its membership changes, right? Yeah, absolutely. We saw the AG of Mississippi bring this back um, during Amy Comey Barrett's confirmation hearings. They they knew the, the shift that was going to be happening on the court, and the anti-choice movement is certainly trying to take full advantage of that, which is why it's incredibly crucial that the Democratic House and Senate pass the Women's Health Protection Act, which would be legislation that could protect against these, these, these laws. Are, are any of the Trump court members wild cards in your mind? I seem to recall Brett Kavanaugh before his controversial confirmation assuring Susan Collins that he thought Roe was settled law and that he would respect long-established precedent. I I'm guessing you don't expect him to rule that way. Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, I don't know what's in Brett Kavanaugh's mind, but we've seen how he wrote and spoke about abortion for years leading up to his confirmation hearings. And the choice movement repeated repeatedly cited the fact that this was misleading and that this was untrue. There was nothing about his his history, uh, either in, in politics or as a judge, that made it seem that he thought Roe was actually settled. Um, in fact, he had writings that showed the other way. So this was a warning sign that the choice community had put up about, about all three of Trump's uh, nominees, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Amy Comey Barrett, that they did not think this was settled law, and this is what would happen. The Mississippi law that the court is taking on would ban abortion after 15 weeks. But the court said it was going to examine whether, and this is a quote, all pre-viability prohibitions on elective abortions are unconstitutional. What does that mean to you? Is that the open invitation that they could just tear down all of Roe all the way through or, or hold up any restriction any state wants to put in place? Yeah, I think it's, a, it's an open invitation to take a look at a number of different challenges that are happening in different states that are coming up through the courts. And I think this is a goal of these, these judicial nominees. There was a litmus test put forward by President Trump and um, 
regarding who he would nominate to the court and that they had to be someone who was anti-choice. And this is the fulfillment of that. And this is, this is something that the Democrats need to take a hard look at in that Democrats for a long time have ignored how important judicial nominees are up and down the courts from, from the appeals to the Supreme Court. And we haven't funded state legislatures during state legislative races to the tune that Republicans have. And that's changed a bit recently, but we really need to understand how important state legislative chambers are and how important judicial nominees are to the politics of this country. It's not just about having a majority in the House. I know that you and uh, a lot of pro-choice advocates are going to say a 15-week cap is you know, it's going to put a lot of women in a, in a difficult position. Some people are going to hear 15 weeks and say that's not that doesn't sound unreasonable. Uh, give a little context. Why, why is that so uh, oppressive or, or so difficult for so many? I mean, that's still in the in the first trimester. Um, I mean, it just just outside of of that. Uh, this is something that is deeply personal to each woman in each case. We cannot be deciding at the courts what women should or shouldn't do with their bodies. Women know what's best for them and their families, and it should be a choice between them and their doctor at any point in the pregnancy when they feel this is the decision they need to make. So what does the United States without Roe versus Wade as precedent look like? And we may wind up in a situation, blue states have been trying to protect abortion rights and abortion access through their own legislation. Could we wind up with red state and blue states having different laws when it comes to abortion policies? Yes, absolutely. We could wind up with states having different policies uh, about who and when you can access this reproductive uh, health care. And what you're going to find is a lot of communities, um, primarily people who are lower economics and and a lot of communities of color that are going to have a lot of trouble having access and you're going to have a certain economy a middle class and, and maybe the upper middle class who are going to be able to access that reproductive care by going to Canada or being able to travel to another state and afford that ability um, it's it's just it's sickening it's sad finally you work currently as a, a democratic strategist and as you've noted throughout the interview, it's, it's kind of impossible to separate abortion policy from abortion politics. As you've noted, we've been getting warning signs about Roe for two decades, if not longer, but it always seemed like a more distant threat. If the court overturns or seriously punctures Roe, what's the impact on both our national politics, but also on these growing calls to expand or, or alter the court itself? Yeah, I think that you're going to see support for what the court looks like and how it changes grow. I mean, the reality is that 70% of Americans support a woman's right to choose. We have done a million polls nationally in individual states across all kinds of different communities. And the majority of Americans do believe a woman should have the right to choose. This will fire up a whole generation because you're right. I think there has been a little bit of a lackadaisical amongst some because they always grew up in a world that had Roe and had that access. And to all of a sudden be faced and without it changes your worldview on the importance of having uh, reproductive health options. And this is not this is not a generation of women who, you know, are are my age or younger that have actually been in America that didn't have that kind of access. So you're gonna see it becoming incredibly important uh, within the democratic politics. And we go through issues all the time from, from guns to the border to taxes, and, and often we'll come to the conclusion, yeah, but that's not necessarily a voting issue. It doesn't drive people to the polls. Abortion is a voting issue. Abortion does drive people to the polls, yes? Yes, absolutely. Um, it's crucial health care for women, and, and it, drives, it drives folks on both sides to the polls. Nicole Brenner-Schmitz is a Democratic strategist. She's also a former political director for NARAL, the oldest abortion rights advocacy group in the United States. Really appreciate the time, Nicole. Thank you. Thank you. And up next, an update on COVID. The former head of the Centers for Disease Control will join us to discuss the CDC's messaging on masks, the effectiveness of the vaccine, and more. We can and we must reopen schools 
in the fall for in-person teaching, learning, and support. And we must keep them open fully and safely five days a week. The United States will not be fully back until we're fully back in school. And my union is all in. That's the head of the union that represents nearly two million teachers. She's pushing to get all kids back into classrooms with the Pfizer vaccine. Now approved for use on kids as young as 12, that's certainly gonna help. But there are still a lot of open questions about masks for both children and adults. Store to store, state to state, confusion for many Americans. Okay, should I take my mask off? Should I leave it on? It's super confusing. The CDC issuing new guidance last week saying fully vaccinated people don't need to wear masks in most cases. From the Las Vegas Strip to the ballpark and the French Quarter in New Orleans, many rejoicing over the weekend. But businesses, employers, states and cities can still make their own rules. Trader Joe's lifted its mask order and Starbucks has made them optional. But 22 states still have some sort of mask mandate in place, meaning in those areas you'd still have to wear face coverings regardless of retailer policies. If they're vaccinated, they are safe. If they are not vaccinated, they are not safe. This is not permission for widespread removal of masks. So far, the CDC says more than 123 million Americans are vaccinated, about 37% of the population. But the largest nurses union in the country is condemning the decision, saying it puts those who are immunocompromised, children and frontline workers, at risk. Those that have gone to work every single day during this pandemic, they depend on every layer of protection. Some experts agree it's too soon. There are a lot of people that are not yet fully vaccinated that are still in the process, and I think we should wear masks for them. Is it time? No, for me, not enough people are vaccinated for me to really feel safe, because how do you know if somebody's vaccinated or not when they're not wearing their mask? For more, thing, for more on all things COVID and masking related, we turn to an expert's expert. Dr. Richard Besser is a former acting director of the CDC. He's currently president and CEO of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Dr. Besser, we saw more than a little bit of mask related whiplash last week after the CDC surprised many changing its masking recommendations for vaccinated Americans. Lots of people still figuring out what their own personal masking policies are going to be. That leads to two questions. First, do you agree with their changes? And secondly, I assume you're vaccinated. What's your personal policy for indoor mask use? Where do you still wear one? Yeah, you know, Andrew, I, I, I do agree with the changes that CDC made, and I think you're, you're spot on that it's going to take a little while for, for states, localities, businesses uh, to figure out how to implement this. Uh, you know, the science is, is, is clear that if you are fully vaccinated, two weeks after your final dose, um, you have incredibly high levels of protection. These are some of the, the, the highest levels of protection we've seen from, from any vaccine. And so I was really excited. I am fully vaccinated. Um, I'm enjoying going outside and, and not wearing a mask, but I, I'm in New Jersey and in New Jersey, uh, the indoor masking uh, rules and regs are still gonna stay in place uh, given we've seen very high, high uh, cases of COVID until very recently. <laughs> People still do have questions about how to handle or, or the possible risks from unvaccinated people going maskless. Obviously, they should get vaccinated is the mantra, but we know that many won't. It, it, we know it's an obvious danger to the people who aren't vaccinated, but why isn't it a danger to vaccinated people, especially with all these variants still running around out there? Yeah, so it's going to be important for, for CDC to continue to monitor uh, cases in the United States. Are we, do we continue on this, on this steady downward uh, movement or, or does it reverse? And it's important to watch for variants. But right now, we're very fortunate in that the, the variants that we're seeing in the United States are covered by the vaccines. Uh, and vaccinated people uh, really are at very, very little risk from someone who is who is unvaccinated. The, the, the concern, Andrew, though, is that not everybody is vaccinated and children under 12 don't have vaccines available to them. And so it's very important uh, that parents with young children continue to follow those masking rules and that people who aren't vaccinated wear masks to ensure that they're helping to protect those people who, who, uh, who can't be vaccinated right now.
As you mentioned, among the groups having the greatest difficulty dealing with the change in policy are businesses who now have to balance worker and customer safety with the risk and hassles and headaches that come from telling angry people that they need to mask up. What advice would you give to businesses? What criteria should they be using to determine their own mask policies? Well, I think there's there's a couple things. First is they need to follow the, the local and the state rules and regulations on this. Uh, beyond that, they need to make sure that their workers um, have full access to vaccination because while uh, while vac there are enough vaccines for everyone in America who, who wants them, uh, for many people, there's still challenges and there are barriers to, to getting vaccinated. Uh, Black Americans, Latino Americans uh, have been vaccinated at much lower rates, and a lot of that has to do with barriers. Many people can't take time off work to get vaccinated, and if they have uh, a sore arm or feel pretty lousy the day after, uh, they don't have sick leave to take off. So can we make it easier and easier for people to be vaccinated? But if you're your business, uh, you want to know, uh, are your employees vaccinated? Especially if you're thinking about you know, a setting like a restaurant or a crowded bar, uh, you don't want to put your own workers in harm's way by having people in there uh, who aren't wearing masks, uh, even though they, they've not been vaccinated themselves. To that end, that uncertainty certainly could make for a more compelling case for vaccine passports so businesses can better identify who's vaccinated and who's not. Right now, that's all a state-by-state state decision. New York uses one. Florida has outlawed them. Do you think we should be leaning more on vaccine passports? Well, it, it's such a divisive issue in, in, in America right now uh, that I don't think even if it's, you know, it would be wonderful if, if you had an easy way to know whether someone was vaccinated. I just don't think that there's the political reality to make that that happen. Uh, the federal government is not going to mandate that, and each state will will end up having their own, own practices. Uh, one of the things that we'll continue to watch is the, the number of cases that are occurring each day. And, you know, if that gets down to a level that is very comparable to what we would see in a typical flu year, uh, then I think that we can all breathe a little sigh of relief and recognize that, yes, there will be some, some disease transmission, uh, but the people who are at the greatest risk for severe disease, for hospitalization and death, We'll have, uh, we'll have uh, broad access to vaccination. And thankfully, I'm a, I'm a pediatrician, thankfully young children um, are at very low risk for having severe COVID infection. Uh, it's still worth protecting them. There, we have lost uh, several hundred children from, from COVID and there are thousands who've developed a, a rare in inflammatory condition. So you don't wanna take this lightly. But thankfully, uh, we, your risk of having severe infection goes way down as you get younger. What about in schools? Do you, does the does that lower risk for kids, if you will, lower the need for vaccination? Should, should they be required for in-person schooling for kids 12 and older? Well, you know, this is something that's decided on a state-by-state -state basis. Uh, the federal government can make make recommendations on that, uh, but it's decided on the state basis. I, I would think that for for many parents, uh, having their kids vaccinated is going to be the right decision. Um, the reason for that is thinking about children going to middle school, going to high school, uh, being able to do that and, and potentially taking off their mask and having a, a, a somewhat normal or quite close to normal experience would be an absolutely wonderful thing. You know, thankfully, there's vaccines for teachers and staff since they are at a, at a greater risk of having severe infection. But it's, I, I think it's really important that, that parents ask questions. Uh, they get answers to, to their questions so that they can make a decision that's right for them and their families. They can go to a website, getvaccineanswers.org, and it's got great information there to, that should address most, most parents' concerns. But if not, talk to your child's doctor. Uh, make sure that, that any questions you have are getting answered so that you can truly make an informed decision. As a former acting director of the CDC, do you think the Biden CDC handled this mask policy or recommendation properly? There's been reporting that the current director, Dr. Walensky, had signed off on the new mask recommendations, even as she testified to Congress about the importance of the older recommendations earlier in the week. I'm sure you can see how that might generate more questions. You think the CDC handled it properly? Well, I, I think the outcome is the right one in terms of, of this recommendation. I would have liked to have seen some uh, some more uh, foreshadowing so that we were we had insights into the thought process. 
you know, maybe a week ago, two weeks ago, hearing that CDC was was looking at the, the trends in America. And if they continue to come down, we might be able to loosen up some of the requirements. They were looking at studies about how these vaccines work in real practice. And if they continue to show the incredibly high effectiveness, that might lead to a change. Uh, and they were looking at the data to see, could people who were fully vaccinated sp still spread infection to others? And there was encouraging signs. So there, there are ways of giving hints to the direction that you're going without saying it's a conclusion that might have helped bring people along so it wasn't quite so surprising. Finally, Dr. Besser, I spent some time online this week trying to listen in or read in on what vaccine skeptics were saying. And many came to the point that the vaccines aren't approved, that they've only got emergency use authorization. So hopefully, hoping you can help me tamp down some of those questions. Is there a difference between those two statuses? Should, one Im should that impact whether somebody gets a vaccine? Well, there, there is a difference. You know, the, the bar for getting an authorization from FDA in an emergency is, is, is lower. And so these vaccines were approved or authorized based on two months of, of safety data and effectiveness data. Uh, but we're way past that now. And now we've seen these vaccines administered to hundreds of millions of, of, of arms. And we've seen how incredibly safe they are and how incredibly effective they are. It's my hope that soon we'll see a full approval. Uh, but for people who are waiting to see, are they safe? Um, are they effective in real use? Um, those questions have been answered and they've been uh, answered in ways that, that give me a lot of confidence when I recommend these vaccines for, for my patients, uh, when I recommend them to uh, my, my patients' families and to my own families and friends. Some fantastic insight from Dr. Richard Besser, former acting director of the CDC, now president of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Dr. Besser, thank you so much. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. And up next, we pivot to politics. Republicans haven't been able to hamstring President Biden yet, at least when it comes to how the public feels about the president. So now they're trying to make every bad news story his fault. That and other potential worries for Democrats next. For four years, it felt like a never-ending stream of chaos and controversy coming from the Trump White House. And other than policy, the seeming lack of chaos now may be the biggest change from Trump's tenure to that of Joe Biden. A feeling that Biden tapped into last week, talking about the oil pipeline gas shortages. Don't panic, number one. I know seeing lines at the pumps or gas stations with no gas can be extremely stressful. But this is a temporary situation. And we saw Biden appeal to that same sense of calm this weekend as he urged Israeli and Palestinian leaders to end their ongoing attacks. And Biden has been urging calm and patience as the nation has emerged from the worst of the COVID pandemic. That approach and the contrast between Biden and Trump may help explain Biden's positive approval rating, 53 percent, and why his approval is 12 points above water, both numbers that Trump never came close to. But if you flip over to Republican TV, you might very well conclude that we're approaching the apocalypse. Everything is going wrong, they say, around the world and here at home. And of course, they know who to blame. And that's why it's so important to have a united front and stand up against this radical agenda. And look, Joe Biden's failure of leadership is on full display. Find a bad news story and they're blaming Biden for it. Israel and Hamas close to all out war, Biden's fault. Despite Trump's boasting after two Israeli Arab cooperation deals were signed last September. After decades of division and conflict, we mark the dawn of a new Middle East. Not so much. Now that's first in a long list. Last week's gas shortages after a key pipeline was hacked, Biden's fault. A spring surge of border crossings, Biden's fault. The slower than expected job numbers and rise in some consumer prices, guess who they're blaming? They're waiting in lines to get gasoline, killing jobs. Inflation is through the roof. Look at the lumber prices right now. Uh, anything you buy at the grocery store is up, and Joe Biden is paying people not to work. So how should the president and Democrats respond, or should they? Let's bring in our next guest to discuss, Democratic strategist Crystal Knight. 
So, Crystal, how should President Biden, the White House, and Democrats combat this everything is in chaos claim from the GOP? Or should they leave it alone? I get the upside of not responding and just getting stuff done, which is the approach the White House seems to be taking. But left unchallenged, those things can take fester and root. Well, I think the press secretary has already done a great job with combating this, this rumor, if you will. When you're the president, you have to rule whether it rains one day or whether it's, it, the sun is shining one day. And right now, the White House is, you know, having a lot of challenges rain on their parade. And so I don't think that it's important for the president directly to address this. That's why he has a communications department. He has a press secretary, a capable person in Jen Psaki, and she has already addressed that the president and, and the administration is attempting and is actively going through the challenges and handling them head on. This is a time for Americans to see the president lead, and that's exactly, exactly what he's doing. Among those chaos issues we went through in the intro, I've seen some polling that gives Biden less than great numbers on the border. Is there any indication that the public is blaming him for anything else like what's happening in Israel or the pipeline? Well, these are challenges that were unforeseen when he took office. One thing that we absolutely know is the border crisis is always the border crisis. That's not anything that's unique to President Biden. Other presidents have had to figure out what to do. Immigration is a tough issue, and I don't wish that on any president, no matter if it's Democrat or president or, or Republican. Um, and so I don't think that these you know challenges are unique. I wouldn't even call them chaos. These are things that happen to every single president when he he takes office. And so he is figuring out his agenda on the, you know, addressing the surge at the border and figuring out what's the best way to respond. And we have to give him time. He's only been in office a few months. And so if this is what Republicans plan to do throughout his entire administration, then they should just say that they don't support a Democratic president and not make this about Biden and his policies. You know, I'm glad you made that point because I'm not hearing or seeing a lot of Democrats turning these issues back on Donald Trump. And there's an argument to be made that he made all of these issues worse from his supposed peace deals in the Middle East, not very peaceful today, the comedy of infrastructure week when it comes to the pipeline and gas shortage, the pandemic response leading to job problems, and, and of course the border. Plus, most people felt like there was chaos almost every day of his presidency. Why not counter these chaos claims by pushing them back on Donald Trump? Well, listen, President Biden is the president, and I don't think that it serves Democrats well to always go back and say, well, at least we're better than the last guy. We already know that because voters voted for Donald, voted for President Biden. He is the president right now. So the voters have already spoken by making sure that we have a new sitting president, which is absolutely what we have. I think what the Democrats can do is speak with one message and one voice and make sure that everything that we're doing and saying is in support of this administration. As I said earlier, this president has only been in office for a little over a few months. And so what we have to give him you know, time to do is lead. And so he needs to, you know, give us the opportunity to show Americans what his plans are as it relates to rising inflation, as it relates to the border surge, as it relates to, you know, the, the crisis that's happening in the Middle East. And so, again, these things are not unique. Remember, President Biden was the vice president for eight years under Obama. And so he is a tested leader. And we absolutely know and understand that whatever the things that he will come up with to counter all of these challenges that have happened in the last week, it will actually go through. All more than fair points. But if there is one theme that could lead to a sense of chaos among voters, it may well be the rise in crime, especially violent crime in major cities. Crime and policing have become a major issue in the New York City mayoral race, in the race for Philadelphia DA, in Virginia's statewide races, and in all three we're talking about upcoming Democratic primaries. We know this is going to be an attack point uh, for Republicans when it comes to the general elections. For the primaries, this feels like a big moment in the progressive versus moderate Democratic tug of war when it comes to policing issues and ways of combating crime. Do you agree? 
Well, there's been a lot of talk about crime and policing. May 25th will be the anniversary of George Floyd's death, unfortunately, um, but that is a significant date that's going to be imprinted in people, many people's minds, and I'm sure many candidates will be talking about that. How we figure out how to reform policing in America is a tough issue for any president to, to tackle, and so I think that this is a challenge that many districts are trying to figure out what works best for them. And so ultimately, voters will decide who's the best DA, who's the best police chief to you know, help rectify the challenges that have been facing those cities. So this really isn't a federal issue in the sense that, you know, what can President Biden do but help push the George Floyd Policing Act? But it's really up to voters to decide in their respective cities and districts. Understood. And, and police reform is an issue that sort of coincides when it comes to safety and crime issues. I'm just thinking because when it comes to general elections, we, we certainly learned in New York City, New York City elected Rudy Giuliani twice and Michael Bloomberg three times, proving that even deep Democratic strongholds can and will vote Republican when crime and safety is a paramount issue. Other than the economy, which we never know how it's going to be going into the midterms, I have a sense that crime and safety may be the most dangerous issue potentially facing Democrats in the midterms. Uh, I'm curious if you feel the same way. Well, yes, I, I don't believe that crime and safety are really partisan issues. These are things that people all across the board have the same general sense of. They want to be protected. They want to know that the people that they've elected care about protecting citizens in their, in their cities and in their districts. And so what can Democrats do to make sure that the message is best resonating with them? They can identify messaging that really speaks to how they will you know, handle uh, hard crime, how they will handle reform in their respective city. And so I think that's really the messaging is the, bigger, is the biggest piece. And then the policy that will back up the messaging. What kind of policies will a new district attorney implement to make sure that there are bad actors off of the street and also that cops are doing their jobs. And really what we can really look to when we're looking about or when we're thinking about new elected officials, particularly in the, in the DA races, is what's been their past um, stances on policing and policing reform? And then what will they do once they get into office? And then voters have to hold them accountable. Crystal Knight is a Democratic strategist and a former political director for Priorities USA. Crystal, pleasure talking to you again. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me back. And up next, some updates on major stories making news. That includes two guys named Gates, Matt and Bill. Matt is a Florida congressman facing allegations that could get him into huge trouble with the law, and it just got a lot worse for him this morning, while Bill is the billionaire also dealing with allegations, and those got him into hot water with his soon-to-be ex-wife. In this segment, we're going to update you on some major stories making news, starting with the latest legal worries facing Congressman Matt Gates of Florida. A plea deal announced in federal court in Orlando today could prove problematic for embattled Florida Republican Congressman Matt Gates. Joel Greenberg, a one-time close friend of Gates and former Florida county tax collector, pleading guilty to six of 33 federal crimes he was facing, including sex trafficking of a minor. In court filings, Greenberg admits he paid a 17-year-old girl for sex and claims to have introduced her to other adult men who engaged in commercial sex acts. And as part of his plea deal, Greenberg must fully cooperate with federal investigators. His lawyer hinted that could be bad news for Gates. Does my client have information that could uh, hurt uh, an elected official? I guess this is just, you know, must see television. You'll just have to wait and see. No individuals, including Gates, were named in court or in the plea deal, and Gates has repeatedly denied any wrongdoing. Sources tell ABC News the Justice Department has spent months looking into whether Greenberg and Gates paid women cash and other items for sex and travel. Gates has stood firm in his denial of any misconduct and rejecting calls to step down. He's also making jokes about the allegations. I'm a canceled man in some corners of the internet. I might be a wanted man by the deep state. Greenberg also pleaded guilty to federal charges of stalking, identity theft, wire fraud, and has admitted to falsely painting a political rival as a pedophile. 
That former political opponent says the state of Florida failed to monitor Greenberg's behavior. Under a functional and effective system of checks and balances, it is quite possible some crimes might have been prevented. From Matt Gates to Bill Gates, as the Microsoft founder faces allegations of questionable behavior towards women that preceded his recent divorce announcement. New details about the years leading up to the recent announcement that Bill and Melinda Gates were ending their 27-year marriage. The Wall Street Journal reports in 2019, Microsoft's board of directors began investigating Gates for an alleged prior relationship with a female employee. The board reportedly hired a law firm to investigate, but according to the Wall Street Journal, quote, Mr. Gates resigned before the investigation was completed and before the full board could make a formal decision on the matter. Gates's spokesperson telling the journal Gates's decision to transition off the board was in no way related. And this morning, Microsoft saying, quote, throughout the investigation, Microsoft provided extensive support to the employee who raised the concern. This latest scrutiny comes as the New York Times reports Gates had a reputation for, quote, questionable behavior at work-related settings. Writing, on at least a few occasions, Mr. Gates pursued women who worked for him at Microsoft and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Two weeks ago, Melinda Gates filed for divorce, saying their marriage was irretrievably broken. Melinda had reportedly been meeting with divorce attorneys since 2019. Around the same time, Gates's alleged relationship with sex offender Jeffrey Epstein came into public view. According to the New York Times, Melinda wanted Bill to sever ties with Epstein after a dinner in 2013, but, quote, for years, Mr. Gates continued to go to dinners and meetings at Mr. Epstein's home, where Mr. Epstein usually surrounded himself with young and attractive women. Gates's spokesperson responding to the Times saying, quote, your characterization of his meetings with Epstein and others about philanthropy is inaccurate, including who participated. The claim of mistreatment of employees is also false. Now to that pipeline that was shut down by a cyber attack. It is up and running again, but much of the East Coast still feeling residual effects from its shutdown. Fuel is flowing again through the massive Colonial Pipeline, but at thousands of gas stations along the East Coast, the pumps are still dry. Gas Buddy says the biggest shortages are in Georgia, the Carolinas, and D.C., with 83% of stations in the nation's capital still without gas. We found Rita Gunther near one of them, her car out of gas on the side of the road. So how long have you been stuck here? Um, since Friday night. Friday night, you haven't been able to move your car no. at all? And you haven't been able to get gas for the car. Right. The Colonial Pipeline, responsible for supplying 45% of the East Coast fuel, is up and running after a crippling cyber attack forced it to shut down for six days. Sources tell ABC News Colonial paid a Russian-based cyber criminal outfit called Darkside an amount in the low millions of dollars in ransom. Experts attribute the current gas shortage to panic buying, fueled by concerns Colonial wouldn't be able to meet market demands. This is not the result of the Colonial pipeline being shut down, rather news of the pipeline and how that fed fear that there wouldn't be enough gasoline. Americans started to hoard and panic. That surge in demand for gas is also boosting prices. About four bucks a gallon, a little bit less. Yeah, what's the total price? Total price, 65.80. And up next, we're going to pivot to sports and show you an emotional day at the NBA Hall of Fame induction ceremony when Kobe Bryant's widow and Michael Jordan paid tribute to the fallen star. The NBA playoffs will tip off tomorrow with two surprise storylines. LeBron James and the Lakers taking on Steph Curry and the Warriors. That's in a play-in tournament. And then there are the New York Knicks who shocked everyone, even their own fans, by snatching home court for the first round against the Hawks. But over the weekend, it was the superstars of the past that took center stage. The Hall of Fame class of 2020 should have been enshrined last year, but of course the pandemic happened and it was delayed. Its inductees include Tim Duncan, Kevin Garnett, and the late Kobe Bryant. During his speech, Tim Duncan talked about how a tall, lanky swimmer transformed into one of the best power forwards to ever play the game. I didn't pick up a ball until I was 14 years old. I was, I was a swimmer. Uh, I, was, I was happy to swim her. My sister was a, 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 went to the Olympics. I, was, I aspired to go to the Olympics as well. Um, 
lost my motivation to be a swimmer uh, when my mom passed, uh, when my island was hit by a Cat 5 hurricane and, and uh, my competition side of my swimming was taken away. Um, my fellow classmates at St. Dunstan's, my, um, uh, my sister's husband, Ricky, were there to step in and, and guide this lanky, uncoordinated kid uh, who was way behind um, and teach me all about the game, um, take me all around the island to play in pickup games and leagues and everything else. Uh, so to those guys, uh, to Ricky, thank you. Thank you for being there for me. Next up, Kevin Garnett. He was one of the original players to go straight from high school into the NBA. Garnett took the time to thank NBA legend Isaiah Thomas and also his mother. I want to thank Isaiah Thomas for being up here. It's a huge, it's a huge honor for you to be up here with me, Z. Thank you. You know, a lot of people didn't know. A lot of people didn't know uh, back in uh, when I was a young guy in uh, Chicago. Z gave me some profound uh, advice, uh, which made me or helped me make a decision of going to straight to high school. So I want to thank you, Z. Seriously, thank you. I think today they would call that tampering. So you know. But um, a lot of people don't know I'm from South Carolina. I'm a country boy. Um, I like to say that. Help hone my skills. My mother's a very intense and very passionate woman who cared about her craft, cared about the quality of her craft. And I think I took some of that from her. So if you guys want to blame me or blame the intensity, blame her for that. The highlight of the ceremony came from Vanessa Bryant, the wife of the late great Kobe Bryant, who of course passed away in January of 2020, along with their daughter Gianna in a helicopter crash. Here's a sample of her address. I used to always avoid praising my husband in public because I felt like he got enough praise from his fans around the world and someone had to bring him back to reality. Right now, I'm sure he's laughing in heaven because I'm about to praise him in public for his accomplishments on one of the most public stages. I can see him now, arms folded, with a huge grin saying, isn't this some <laughs> He's still winning. I wish my husband was here to accept this incredible award. He and Gigi deserve to be here to witness this. Gigi would be so proud to watch her daddy get enshrined into the Basketball Hall of Fame. I don't have a speech prepared by my husband because he winged every single speech. He was intelligent, eloquent, and gifted at many things, including public speaking. However, I do know that he would thank everyone that helped him get here, including the people that doubted him and the people that worked against him and told him he couldn't attain his goals. He would thank all of them for motivating him to be here. After all, he proved you wrong. People don't know this, but one of the reasons my husband played through injuries and pain was because he said he remembered being a little kid sitting in the nosebleeds with his dad to watch his favorite player play. Congratulations, baby. All of your hard work and sacrifices paid off. You once told me, if you're going to bet on someone, bet on yourself. I'm glad you bet on yourself, you overachiever. You did it. You're in the Hall of Fame now. You're a true champ. You're not just an MVP. You're an all-time great. I'm so proud of you. I love you forever and always. Kobe Bean Bryant. We'll be back to wrap up RFL right after this. That is going to do it for us tonight here on RFL. I'm Andrew Whitman. Thank you so much for joining us. Your next RFL tomorrow night at 6 p.m. Eastern. Until then, have a great night.